everyone. I am Joshua Maloney, President of Student Veterans of America at Cape Cod Community College. I am here with uh, several students, faculty members, including our advisor, Christine, Dean Christine McCary. Thank you so much for being here. We had a uh, fantastic presentation about an hour ago by Michaela Black, opened by the president of the college, President Cox, and it was tremendous. We're here for our second part of our presentation, talking about veterans here on campus. And we have somebody special and a little bit different. Matt Noon is a dog trainer on Cape Cod, and he specializes, uh, I've worked with him as a veteran, and he specializes in service dogs for veterans and other people, and is an expert in what service dogs provide to people with trauma or other. So Matt, thank you so much for coming and meeting me. Yeah, happy to be here. So can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Why, first off, why veterans? Um, mine, like you talked about, which is uh, mostly for me, it started with my father, um, being a combat veteran. And, you know, and back then when I started this over 20 years ago, um, those days there were really service dogs for veterans. So it was kind of touch and go at that point because the only two real major service dogs at that point were assistance dogs and uh, guide dogs for farm. And once I started to see the effect of having my father working with them, developing these dog talents, it kind of changed a lot of it. And, uh, you know, just dealing with his PTSD and stuff, it really helped mitigate a lot of those symptoms like keeping him occupied um, with the animal. Uh, and just one thing sort of led to another. And really, like when my father saw the benefits of what it did for his life, he really wanted me to um, push it forward to help other veterans. So, do you work with your father personally by yourself training? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And was that your first experience with dogs? That was my first service dog ever trained. Yeah. So, how did you get into dogs? Um, completely on accident. I moved to the Cape. Really? <laughs> yeah. The, uh, I grew up in New York, and uh, my parents' gift to me is when we moved to the Cape, if I was willing to move with them, um, that they would let me get a dog for first time. How old were you then? Uh, 14. So essentially a child uh, habit. So so you're dealing with your father, uh, combat veteran. What um, what era? Uh, this was 1994-ish. Okay. And what, um, what conflict was he in? Um, he's actually a Korean woman. Oh, so he had great. extra struggles up beyond that. Uh, so there know. must have been a struggle from the war until 1994. That's a that's a lifetime. Right? Yeah, that and, and just really there was no outreach. There was no label. Yeah. There was no help for people that kind of just in those days called shell shock. It was kind of treated quite literally. Yeah, and it just like it was, it was really unfortunate. And, and like I said, like for me. Growing up it was very strange. As I got older, I didn't realize that everybody's parents didn't have it. I just assumed, like, you know, that was everybody's dad. So what it did so normal? Did you serve yourself? I didn't. Okay. So what um what things did you see growing up that maybe now you see that maybe some other people may not understand? Um what are those things? One of the one of the strange things that really started to stand out to me when I was young, I was um, a very top level athlete and I played a lot of sports. Um, at a state level, and my father never came to any of the games, and so that started to get a lot of that started to get a lot of attention to the parents. You know, like they just thought it was very strange that somebody that you know at any level, but especially to be that talented and, and to not have your father there ever, uh, started to raise a lot of eyebrows and stuff. And it was it was tough, you know, like not understanding his thing. He just he when his most major trigger is uh, yelling. He had a real, real hard time with those crowds yelling or any type of chaotic things like that. He'd have to take over situations immediately. But it was just, it'd be a meltdown. And you observed this as a child? Oh, yeah, from the time I was probably just walking, you know, feeling like that. And you also said that, the, so you helped train your dog, uh, excuse me, your dad's service dog, and you said that the dog helped. Is he your father? Can you explain what, what um, you noticed? It was it was kind of a, a, a weird situation. Like the uh, my parents just split up when I was about 19 years old, and my dad was living by himself at that time. And 
he started becoming like a recluse. Uh, he just wasn't taking it to family events, wasn't getting out of the house. And I knew this was like bad news, you know, like it just, I, I couldn't have it, I couldn't let it happen. But also knowing my father and how things work, I had to make it look like it was his idea. You know, like, so, I relate as a veteran. You know, you're not going to toss it better. No, 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 that's a bad it's idea. It's not, not advisable, especially <laughs> if it's your father. The, uh, you know, and, and so I made it look like it was something the dog needed. Oh. You know, and, and so I spent an insane amount of time teaching the dog how to uh, steal his blankets every morning and drag them oh. to the front door specifically. Um, so, you know, nobody wants to stay in bed once the blanket you go. Sure, why not? And uh, it took him about I don't know, it was probably a couple of weeks, a month, something like that, before he really connected with dogs. And through a lot of fighting and everything, he thought the dog was just misbehaving. He didn't realize how much, I never told him how much effort I put in teaching her how to do this. And um, he finally called me one day and he goes, you know, he goes, I figured out what's wrong with the dog. He wants to go for a walk. He goes, because he's always bringing the blanket to the door. So he's like, I assume that he wants to go outside and go for a walk or whatever. And it was really neat because he, uh, on top of, you know, so many combat issues or whatever, he had heart problems and everything, whatever. And um, so walking was a really important component to all this as well. And uh, so he started initially just walking from Trump River and Falmouth um, as far as he could get. His goal was to walk with the dog. Time. Yep, every day um, with the dog. And at the beginning, he couldn't make it very far, like maybe half a mile, a quarter mile, something like that. Um, but after about six months, he was able to finally walk to all the way to Woods Hole. And then I would go and pick him up and, and drive him back. But eventually, he could walk all the way to Woods Hole. He got a pie in the sky, get a little bit of lunch or whatever, and walk all the way back to Trump River. And it changed his whole dynamic. You know, seeing the dog so well trained, you know, really drew, drew a lot of attention, whether he wanted it or not, you know. But um, it helped him socialize more, really took him out of his element. Um, and he liked the element of working with the dog because a lot of people I know that have PTSD also have a lot of control issues. And it doesn't go well with humans, you know. But where with dogs, if it's a proper training, you can't overtrain them. You know, so it was a great way to mitigate a lot of those, those symptoms. Um, and, and the dog loved them just that much more for I, I think that's a very powerful way to sort of how that worked for you and how you were able to put that. Son, I, I talked to some other sons of Korean War veterans who have watched and said similar things. And it's difficult. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, anybody watching that type of thing in your family. Seems like you reached out in a typical way, almost. You know, maybe some people would think of reaching out and say, "What's wrong with you? Yeah, Cut yeah. it out! You know, come to my game." Yeah. Which, as you said, may not be the best. But I like how you supported and just kind of said, "Yep, yeah, I'm doing this." So, was there a time in there when it clicked that maybe this would work for other veterans? Yeah. Um... Once the dog was like finished, the training was really finished. And uh, my dad became a great ambassador because, you know, I spent almost my whole life in the VA, going on go with them everywhere, no matter which state we lived in or whatever. And it really started connecting when we go to uh, West Roxbury uh, specifically. They had a big area there where they would exchange books and things like that. And um, more and more people are asking, you know, because not only did he have a service dog, but he had a Italian master. What year was this one more time? This was 98, uh, 2000. This, yeah, it was right, right around that, that time. Um, and so he spent a great deal of time helping other veterans and stuff and found, you know, about this amazing experience with the dog because he was heavily medicated, as, as a lot of veterans are, you know, to the point where it was just crazy. People would steal not dying. Well, yeah, well, they would just mail the medication to the house and be sitting on the front porch. Yeah. Like, I never, you know, thinking about that now, it's just crazy. The VA does that to me. And it should well, be, uh, yeah, just a packet of pills every time. The scary part about. for me is my father's a very capable individual, but I also know a lot of veterans that worked over the years that, you know, are physically immobilized and they, they're getting robbed or different things like that. Like it's a technical danger, yeah. you know, to be distributing um, medication like that. Yeah, it really is. So, yeah, so this, you know, it is a very complex thing, but it's really nice to kind of become an ambassador because you lived it. You know, you talk to so many of the veterans that they would ask little questions here and there, and he was very open to them. Um, you know, he bring his things. dog all sorts of everywhere. <laughs> Oh, is there anywhere that like you did? Not that I know. <laughs> so, so it was like the typical, yeah, person, uh, person in their service dog. Right? If you oh. rode with my father, you rode the back seat. The dog, the dog the back. I love it. I it love it. That kind of thing. The own kid goes the back. Nice, nice. 
So what was your first experience of maybe reaching out to another person and saying, hey, I think that I could help this person, not, hey, I'm doing this for my father. Um, I had a, a very good friend of mine um, who was in uh, the storm, um, who's a former SEAL, and uh, he he was the one. He had a problem. I thought he was totally out of control. He thought he was going to create it himself. <laughs> just, you know, which is amazing because we've been friends ever since. Uh, we're still very close to this day. Uh, but same thing, like big, strong guy or whatever, but just, it, it just, there was something missing, you know, and, and he would find all these different ways to um, kind of mitigate the issues of PTSD by like my motorcycles or guns or spending excessive money or just whatever. And he just said he always felt empty until the dog thing came in, you know, and ever since then, we're actually starting a new project uh, next month, which I'm excited about. You want to see him uh, tomorrow night. With the same guy that you just Yeah, yep. he, just got his, he just got his new South Africa horrible puppy. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, he now lives in Maine. And uh, just an amazing, amazing individual has come a long way. He actually moved to uh, Eton. He was uh, very heavily dedicated to the VA stuff. He became addicted to uh, opiates. And the dog was the big savior. Uh, it's, you know, I can't be you know, compromised with all these drugs and stuff. He'll take care of the dog. Right. So more accountability. Yeah, yeah. And, and the dog, you know, I, I told him, I said, this is, this is my rules and regulations, so to speak. Like, if, if you want me to take this on, I'm not going to be us around. I need you to be clear headed. And, uh, and he agreed. So, fast forward to everything that you know now. I think you're very skilled. I've worked with you. Um, what is it that helped? Why did the dog help your father? Why did the dog help? What was it about? My personal training? opinion, I just. And it's the same thing that, that's helped me over the years is to me dogs are the tangible embodiment of unconditional love it's the easiest way i can explain it they just they're so much better than people in every way you know and just to be able to confide in something like that's never going to be wrong it's never going to give away your secrets and it'll hurt you and it's just it's an incredible feeling you know it's love like we dream of you know and to be able to wake up to that every day and the animal be there it's just an incredible feeling and what about, so I get nervous uh, as a veteran because I hear the stories that there are like bad or fake dogs. I've been, um, you know, in the city walking my dog and I've had another dog with like a service dog desk come up and start yelling and barking at my dog. And so what, this this is kind of a double-edged sword, what I'm, what I'm finding. Um, yes, there are some fraudulent activities. Um, along the lines of service dog because we wouldn't want to be able to bring the dog everywhere, you know, if they're, if they're a dog lover. But what I find right now is it's, it's almost like a mixed 50-50. Um, half the people that I find are just kind of BSing their way through to bring the dogs to college or bring them, bring them to work or whatever, just because they want to be with the dog. They don't put the work, time, or effort into it. But the other half, what I'm finding is um, lack of funding. The dogs are expensive. And the way the government has worded it is you don't need a trainer, technically speaking, to have a fully trained service dog, which is a tricky um, situation because the average person can't train the dog to pass a basic obedience class on. And it's not—it's not being rude; it's just that's a fact, yeah. you know. And, and so, like the, the chance of you being able to behaviorally condition that dog, and that's the biggest part. You know, obedience is the easiest part of dog, in my opinion. Behavior conditioning is a whole other thing that is one has nothing to do with the other. And so, being able to condition that dog to be able to go to all these places and not be a nuisance. Is the real trick of the trade and so these people may make some progress in their home or something like that but not having funding and not having a, a viable outlet to really learn the the nuances of what it takes to produce a finished product can be a really tricky thing you know and so i think that causes a lot of problems and i'm getting called out just puts them in a more combative situation which scares me you know because it's such a big deal for somebody to leave, leave the house sure you know and then to get just have somebody you know verbally accost you or over you know, because of these other people who have fake service dogs. So it's like a, you know, it's kind it's of an happy catch point too right now. So what are some, what are the ways that people are getting legitimate service dogs in America right now? Um, more and more trainers are, are um, helping people get through the steps of it um, by selecting the right candidate to begin with or evaluating the dog. Because one of the other big um, fallacies is, is like only certain breeds can service dogs. You know, which I always like to say provocative things to people because 
how else do you break a mold? You know, and, and so I tell people, like, you know, if you use that terminology with people, you'd be a bigot. Yeah. You know, like, there's, there's no, like, it's not only golden retrievers that can do this, they're only labs. Like, that's crazy. Right. You know, it's, it's like saying anybody who's Italian can box, you know, or whatever. Like, that's, it, and unless you say something like that, it doesn't connect to people. So I tell people, like, the most important part of the service dog is selection. So the person for a job, you know, anybody can learn martial arts, let's say. That doesn't mean everybody's committed to it to the point of enjoying it. Sure. You know, and so we want an animal that's going to enjoy the job, so it's a good fit for both parties. So it's really tricky when we select the dogs. I usually fail, you know, 20 to 30 candidates before I find one that I think is going to be decent. It's not, a, it's not just a quick thing. You need a balanced dog. You need a dog with strong temperament um, to be able to endure the day-to-day -day activities. So meeting, like, somebody running by or making a loud noise or something, that dog should be passive, you know, in all those venues. There's no command for be good or don't be scared. You know, you can't tell somebody not to be scared. Right. <laughs> you have to be feeling it. Right. Okay. And if you are and you can't fix that, then you're not a good candidate for that particular job. Sure. Simple as that, you know. But where it gets trickier with dogs is it's not just, a, you know, like a TV that you exchange. There's emotions involved. I deal with this with law enforcement as well when they're replacing a dog with a neighbor or on the job or a retire. Uh, there's a lot of emotional connection there. And that's really hard to kind of like recreate that, you know, and start another career with a new partner. Um, and that's, that's essentially what it is. But once it's done, um, we break it into pieces so that they're attainable goals, you know, is what I, what I've also been finding a lot lately in the last few years is not everybody needs a service dog. Some people just enjoy the training you know, and um, have, like having a high level trained dog where they can control them when they have their outings, you know? Um, so it, it kind of gives people a little more insight because I think even to this day, there's a lot of um, misinformation out there. Uh, yeah. A lot of, a lot of misunderstanding of people with dogs in, in general, uh, but especially when it comes to service animals. So I've heard a lot of, um, a, 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 a lot of things paralleling to what you just said. I had a veteran friend who engaged with a so-called um, veteran uh, dog agency that just kind of sent the veterans these trained dogs and he read about them online, engaged with them, and then they mailed him a dog. And that was the last thing that he ever heard from them. He got a dog, it was untrained. Never, it was free, but he right. never got it. It just didn't seem right. It, it, so it that's, wasn't. That's one of the other hard parts for me, too, is, is you know, dogs aren't robots. You know, uh, it's not like just purchasing a car that's going to operate a certain way or whatever. There's chemistry, there's a lot of other things that are involved. But the way that I, I train with my veterans and stuff, it's, it's a little bit controversial, it's a little bit difficult sometimes to hold them accountable. That's not just easy task. You go to me, I'll go to you. You wait and you do it right. I will be there for you every step of the way, but somebody has to hold you accountable. Somebody has to be that stick in the mud. Otherwise, if you just steamroll, you're not taking seriously with anybody else. Right. And so I have some people that go to me for months, and then some out of the woodworks do great. I have people that go straight along and then they fine. You know, it's all different. But with the dog, there's no finished product. And that's one of the things that scares me with PTSD with, with the dogs, in my opinion. Um, it's an ongoing thing. You know, if you don't keep that tool sharp, how do you know that it's operating at its full capacity? Yeah. You know, and so there's a lot of places that mean well. There's, there's quite a few organizations that really mean well, but you cannot turn over a finished product and not have any guidance. It's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and so that's, again, where a lot of trouble comes in because, like, a dog that's, um, let's say, a, a assistance dog for somebody who's, um, you know, has, has some type of physical disability where they can't maybe pick up a remote off the floor or get their medication or something like that. The dog can do that. But what people don't realize is that dog's doing that every day. The dog just being like, the dog just existing, they're keeping up with their training. Sure. PTSD is a whole different animal. You know, you, you take a week off of downtime or two weeks of downtime turns into a month. That's like try doing that to the gym. Sure. <laughs> you will pay when you go back. Right. right. And so that's why PTSD is a very different thing. And that's why at some point I would like to be able to create a group where it's ongoing. You can come and go as you please. It's a little bit easier, but having that camaraderie. Where people um, want to help each other, you know, like you know, I have a lot of people that are further into it. They go, "Hey, you know what? I was there, whatever. And I think my dog is going to get there, whatever. Don't give up." And it kind of helps them have a little bit more foresight for other people who have already done it. You know, earlier the trainer. Earlier we had Michaela talking, and she was talking about that, that like kind of building community in schools for the veterans is really helpful. And it sounds like you're kind of saying something similar that. And also, yeah, the dog's there for you, but also you and all of the other veterans in the group. Well, ultimately, that's always been my goal. Um, 
over the years of different organizations I've worked with and things like that, it's too much on one person. It just is. I get text messages at two o'clock in the morning sometimes or, or whatever. And it's not that I don't want to be there for it, but I, I would love to be there for everyone. But I hate only one person. Yeah. I'm not a professional, you know, mental health care professional or whatever. So I can only do what I can do. Uh, and so what I've seen over the years going through the VA, I mean, it's the camaraderie. The same camaraderie that helps people that, that serve will help them after the fact, but they need something to segue into that. And dogs are such a, it's such a universal thing. It has nothing to do with skin color or height or weight or any of these things. Like they're just, just your dog, you know? And, and so it's really neat to watch people interact with that and to be able to have something that's ongoing. There shouldn't be a finish line rule. You know, like I tell people, I'm like, there's no cure to PTSD. People always get mad when I give speeches and stuff, and I'm famous for always telling people, like, so, you know, scientifically, it takes exactly the same amount of time to regenerate a limb that it does to cure PTSD. You know, and, and again, like, if you don't say things like that, it doesn't register to people that there's no cure. The dog doesn't cure it, the dog mitigates yeah. the difference. You know, with it, with it. Yeah, I get a lot of places I talk to, like, well, I provide this dog, and I think like, cure the PTSD. I'm like, that's not, that's no. not a thing. No. You know, it's designed to mitigate some of the symptoms. And, the dog does that by distracting from situations. Like that. It's your father something. picking up on those. Hey, get downstairs and get outside and go walk me. Walk yourself. Take care of yourself. It took all of that for him to start taking care of himself. Well, what he told me is he said, you know, it takes a special person to serve in the first place. It, it takes somebody that um, wants to have that help of others, you know, wants to give that help up to others. Yeah. So to have that when they have an animal that's a team member always. Right. And, and and so the dog is always there and the dog's always underfoot. And the neat thing that I've discovered over the years of working with them that I've been able to help therapists and you know, mental health care professionals is the condition of the dog is the condition of my veteran. Always. Yeah. Dog's overweight, he's unkept or whatever. I know if they're not getting out enough, the dog is underweight or whatever, I know they're neglecting, I know all of these things without being overly intrusive. So there's there's a lot more than like what meets the eye, what the average person understands. They're really into it for the right reasons. So if somebody, if, um, so first, do you work not with veterans? Do you, uh, yeah, we work. We work. I have um, several women that are survivors of domestic violence. Um, we have the, um, dogs that work with them. Um, we have I have six dogs that I've trained to sniff out explosives for civilians that survived the uh, Boston bombing. Um, they refuse to go out to crowded situations. That so I discussed that I could actually train a dog for them that they uh, thought explosive or solid. So, so victims of the Boston Marathon bombing, you help you, they have dogs, they have that, service dogs, yep. Um, uh, so there's so help they mitigate their PTSD, but the dog takes a step further because there's PTSD is specific, you know. Um, so they have that partner, they have all that stuff. Well, in the trust, the trust, but then the dog also has this miraculous, unbelievable thing that it can just smell explosive. Mm -hmm. which is weird. Yeah, and so we, um, I partnered up with a company that's a pretty neat guy, graduated uh, Annapolis. He uh, developed what's called pseudo narcotics, pseudo explosives. Yeah. So this way, you don't need any special literature from the DEA or ETF to teach civilians. Um, so this really changed the game for us, we're thinking outside the box. So if a, uh, let's first just say anybody, anybody was looking for a service dog, not necessarily a veteran, what would they, right, what would that look like? You know, can you go to your service dog store? Go to the no, store? unfortunately, that, that's a really hard part. That's hard. Typically, what I do is I like to meet the person and kind of get into like what they're looking for, what what um, their expectations are, what my abilities are, and where reality kind of lies in between. So that way everybody's on the same page. You know, because working with a trainer is just like anything else. Like you have to have rapport with that person. You don't get along with them or you don't, um, align with their methods of training and things like that, it's not going to work. It doesn't mean they can't train. It doesn't mean the dog can't learn. It just means the project is just step from the bed. Sure. You know, so you have to kind of get square one out of the way. And then accountability. You know, the dog has to be taught to certain levels because dogs are very much like children. Cognitively, they cap out about a four to five-year-old child. So kids and dogs associate things, like how kids can act in a well-run kindergarten classroom versus kids on the playground. Same kids. Two totally different same day. Yeah. Yeah. And so this is one of the things that caused a lot of problems with dogs. And so in my other part, my business we do protection work. That's why I need a very um, hardy dog that has no fear. It's not that the dog is going to attack it and like that, but I can't have them get scared going into a dark room sure. or going into a different building we've never been to before, things like that. Um, all dogs can detect odors. 
they, 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 you know, that's their specialty. But not all dogs can do it in all environments. So that that's where the specialty part comes in. So something else that you've uh, mentioned a couple times through the detection work in the Boston Marathon. Um, how how is so you can give a person a dog that can help them and then also give them this ability to detect for drugs or whatever. Why why is that helpful? I, I understand the sort of uh, explosives that that helps, but yeah. What about for like bed bugs or for Asian longhorn beetles? So those types of things is um, cost effectiveness, keeping um, you know hotels, houses, things like that from downtime or spread. You know, there's there's a lot of things that people don't realize, and the dog's ability to detect is absolutely incredible. We're learning more about it every day. But what the average person doesn't understand is the largest the, the largest function organ on the human body is your skin. Your skin's constantly permeating different odors and things like that, and so it's very easy for the dog to detect when you have uh, higher level low blood sugar, if you have anxiety, things like that. There's different odors that permeate. The dog gets close to anything; they can start to select odors. So it could be, you know, literally anything you, you could imagine, like you said, like bed bugs or whatever. So their sense of smell, the reason why it's like that, they, the scientists have discovered about 40% of the dog's brain on average is hardwired with the olfactory glands in their nose. That's a pretty significant amount of brain matter to be dilated with that morning cats. And the funny thing is most people spend their entire life fighting with the dog. or something the dog is immensely talented at. <laughs> You know, it's like yeah. such a weird concept. It's its own myself crime. included. You know, I didn't. I wasn't born a professional instructor. I went to learn over the years as well. But I think a lot more dogs would get successfully adopted if people gave them some type of objective. And that's really what we're pushing for going forward: is uh, the detection aspect, whether it's the fun or function. It's really incredible. I think I feel like it almost gives your uh, the veteran as much as the dog, like something to do so it's like stress well and it, and it releases endorphins i mean like you it feels good to no, a sense of accomplishment yeah like and yeah. you know that you it caught the ball it brought it back but every the ball gets boring right so like it i tell people like it's totally different if you were into like let's say you're into cars it's totally different if you built it yourself you know or modified it yourself versus somebody gifting it you know what i mean like there's there's other things at play here so that's why i really like the veterans to be involved if they can't that's that's okay. It's not that they should be excluded, but whenever possible, they should directly be involved in the process. Do you see any problems? So I've seen, um, I told you about my friend that I knew that got a dog shipped to him and never had any training. I've also seen um, organizations train a dog, tip top, best trained dog ever, and that veteran shows up and they say, here you go, and they boot him out the door. There's your service dog, and it's great. You know, the service dog yeah. helps, but are there Something you said is, you know, it's not training's not just a job. No, it's it's a lifestyle. And just like anything, like you have to take care of your tools for your job, just like anything else. So what problems come out of getting a dog, getting a train, and that typically bad behaviors. Um dogs get frustrated just like little kids, you know, they get up and run around or they may be actively bark in the restaurant or things that are unbecoming of a service dog. Um, typically out of frustration, you know, looking for the wrong type of attention to get shot. Um, and that's typical, you know, somebody just because somebody hand you a trained dog doesn't mean you know how to maintain it. And that's really where I see a lot of the breakdown. And I understand it from a logistics standpoint, both financially and time. You know, you want to be able to help as many as possible, but at some point, it'd be really nice to have some type of uh, group effort where the veterans can help each other, sure. you know, and, and help even just keep them motivated, you know, so the dogs go so far down the rabbit hole, they feel like it's unfixable. Well said. So something I see and hear a lot is um, questions about whether or not you know service dogs can actually come everywhere. You, know, you started out by saying that you don't actually need a certified instructor to certify a dog. So, so that's where it gets tricky. So basically, where this really blew the lid off everything was after September 11, 2001. You know, as time went on and we had more enlisted people coming home, we had some and everything kind of came to a head. And they finally admitted that PTSD is real. It's a real thing, and it's happening more often. And, you know, it breaks my heart to think of the predecessors, you know, the, how much suffering they, they've gone through. You know, everybody knows an uncle or somebody who abused drugs or alcohol, something like that. I like to think that their suffering was not in vain because it changed 
our services now are night and day. Thank God. Uh, thank God. Yeah. So yeah, they suffer. They yeah. Did. And, yeah. and and so I, I try to teach people not to pass judgment. You know, I said, I said those are stars. I said, but from my understanding, the people that the circles that I keep, almost every veteran I know that suffers from that would trade places with somebody who lost a limb, which meant they never had to deal with it again. I said that's a profound statement, but it's a true statement. You know, and, and for people to not see that, it's almost scarier because it's the invisible boom. Right. Totally you know? un 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 understandable. And, and, and it's hard because I tell you, like I said, it, it's, it's such a weird concept to see somebody who's hilarious, the life of the party, and completely alone all at the same time. And you I see, see that right so through often. It. I can see right through it. It's almost like a sixth sense. Yeah. Because I grew up with my father. You yeah. Know, my dad was hilarious. I was totally that guy. It's just a Saturday night. But I'd also see him after so how much it took out of him to put that facade on. I know that the more I've spent around um, you know, traumatized veterans, or I come to notice that thousand yard stare mm -hmm. and I recognize it. I, I know that I'm given that face myself and that's how I'm able to relate to it. But it's, um, you know, you pick up on it and it's certainly something that the dog literally picks up on. Oh yeah. Yeah, and so like, like I said, that's, that's why the dog has to be daily conditioned and this is why people shouldn't be petting service dogs, okay? The way the odor molecules work coming off of your pores is it almost, if you could think of it like a cascading fountain, okay, and the water coming down, this gravitational pull from the, the odor molecules coming off. Of so if the dog's nose is in that odor field, the dog's going to do the job, no problem. But if the dog is out here being tapped by somebody externally, the dog will be outside of that odor field and they might miss somebody who's having a seizure, somebody who's having a blood sugar ball or something. It doesn't mean the dog can't do the job, it means your conditioning dog be distracted from the job at hand. That's why the service dogs can stay centrally focused on the camera uh, whenever they're out <laughs> working. And I push the dogs even further than that, where when the vest is off, they're free to be a regular dog. And so they have a switch, you know, and so that way they're not working all the time because they can get burnt out too. It's really tremendous. I like how you care about the dog and then also the matter in relationship. Yeah, it's just, like they said, the dog has done so much for me in my life um, in every aspect. Like, I was never going to be a trainer. <laughs> so you go to Marshall, yeah. you know, and like the switch gears like that, and they get the door, it's just incredible. And uh, it, it just, it's been such a neat part of my life to now watch my kids. My son can train better than most trainers I know. He's incredible. And my daughter's right behind him. And it, it, whether, wherever his life takes them, I don't think they'll ever be without a dog. And so it's so neat to understand the concept of what they can teach already, you know, how they interact with that, because I work a lot. So it's a great way to cheat. Yeah. Spend time with my kids yeah anymore. right. So I always try to find a way to make it look like fun for the kids. So if a veteran or a person is interested in getting one of these dogs, um, America, Massachusetts is a big place. And I think you were on Cape Cod, so we could reach out to you in that in a minute. But what about like other, you know, so there's no certified, how would we know that someone's legitimate? So typically what I tell people is, is contact a, um, a trainer that has a good record of the dogs talk to some of their clients that have the dogs there's something some way of betting that information or they can reach out to me and i know several people in the industry nationwide yeah. uh, my personal business is not kicked out because we have people all over the us um you know we go to logan airport multiple times a week sometimes um the ship dogs and things we, we do all kinds of things with dogs um but what i like about it is the information is growing more now with youtube and so many different social media outlets and it is nicer but that we are kind of a crossroad right now with people that just want to have the dog for fun. And I feel that it's, I need to educate those people to understand the backlash that they have on people that actually need the service dog. Because sure. I don't think any of them, at least in the positive mindset that I try to keep, I, I don't think they do it on purpose. Right. It's you not know? a misintent. It's right. Like, and, and I just want to bring my dog to the movie. Right. You know? But if you bring them in enough time with the, you know, with now with the airlines, they started the whole thing with emotional support animals. Yeah. Emotional support animals are made up title. It's never held any gravity whatsoever. And that hurts a lot of people's feelings, but I'm just like, really take a step back and think about it. Yeah. If you could sit there, take eighty dollars and get a photo ID of some entity you've never interacted with, how much entity you really think it is, you know? And so these things are like so important to bring transparency to because there's a lot of places that frequent like malls and things like that where they have fake service dogs, but you also have to understand the shopkeeper is liable. Their job, like they're they're Legally, they're, they're held liable. If that dog injures one of the patrons, you know, it's on them as well. 
And so I, I'm finding more and more people having um, difficult situations with real service dogs because so many people bought fake service dogs. And so they're having a hard time differentiating the two. So the general guideline between service dogs, the two only, and it's kind of crazy, but the only two real questions that anybody, any entity can ask of a service animal is one, if it's a yes or no answer, is it a service dog? And it's crazy because in the ADA, they don't even have to be labeled, technically speaking. They don't have to wear a vest, they don't have to do anything, which really just opens up Pandora's box. But the second one, if they pay attention to, is a pretty good hallmark. And that's what three tasks can a dog perform on command. You know, if the dog can't go for disobedience to pick something up or do some type of function on cue, it's very obvious when you run the train dog. Sure. I tell people it's a focus all the time being famous. People see me out with my dog with the jaws on the floor. I love three different dogs doing things. Languages yeah. and it's just awesome, but for me, mostly it's just to not feel the stress. Sure, the dogs are ways in the way the kids, you know. Yeah, so what would you say your biggest takeaway from working with veterans and the dogs is? For me personally, I feel like it's um, I feel like it's so you know, um. One of the things that I, I always preach to my kids, I tell them, you know, when they get older, if they decide to serve or whatever, it's totally their choice, the same thing my father told me. And the one thing that always stuck with me, I always teach my kids, I said, not everybody needs to serve, but anybody that's going to consider themselves an American needs to be the type of American that's worth fighting for. And that doesn't mean like whatever your background is, that's irrelevant. Just be a good person, be a good American, you know? And, and to me, to, if I have some way of being able to pay that forward to so many people that have forgotten about or, or overlooked, you know, they spend so much time training you to go and do all these amazing things. There's no evidence for that. There's no real integration how to come back and be quote unquote normal or adjust. Those Jump them back out. Yeah, and, and that's just like, it's so crazy to me because it seems like such an obvious thing that is finally getting attention now, but it should have been all along. You know? and, and it's funny to me that, you know, we look at what we have now and kind of think that it's nothing. Like, well, what about in 2002? What about in the 1990s, Which the 1980s? Yeah. What about a hundred? There was a war yep. called World War One. No, everybody came back, and nobody. Yep. There was nothing. You were taught to just stuff it down. Yeah, stuff that's what you down. will do. You know. So as we come close to the our ending time, uh, what is your business? So we, we have two businesses. We have High Noon Canine, which is professional dogs, for service dogs, police dogs, that type of stuff, security yeah. dogs. And then we have Positive Dog Training, Cape Cod, which is our pet training uh, yeah. partner. Okay, so pet training would be more obedience. Just regular pet stuff. Okay. Would, yeah, the professional then, contract stuff. Like the and then the dogs. other stuff is that's the uh, dog training or the... Uh, the service dog service stuff. Dogs. That's, that's okay. all part of High Noon So you kind of have two different... Yeah, because what I was finding over the years is people thought that I only trained dogs to like jump out of helicopters and do all this crazy stuff. And I'm like, you know, we also train a lot of pets and we save a lot of um, adopted dogs that didn't know how to handle their behavior problems. Um, and that's really like the most important thing going forward because this is a ton of quality obedience training about that. But if you don't feel the dog's behavior, you're not even going down the right road. And that's why a lot of people feel the dogs and uh, they can receive a dog that quote unquote can't be trained. And right, so I right, tell people, right. like, if a kid's exhibiting bad behavior in class, then the more mathematics is not going to fix that. <laughs> like, unless you say that, it doesn't, like, that light bulb. That happen. resonates really Yeah, well. they're like, all right, just do it down for one more hour, Sparky. And, just <laughs> and, love. and I'm like, that's not fixing anything. No. That's suppressing intent. Yeah. You know, exactly. and so well, that's why it becomes volatile, mm -hmm. you know. So how could somebody reach out to you? Do you have a website, email? Yep. So we have uh, emails, high noon canine um, at Gmail. Okay. Um, we have our websites, uh, I knew K9, and then we have uh, positive dog training Cape Cod. Um, you can reach out to any of those, and uh, or by cell, it's um, they can reach out to that number as well on the website. Um, but yeah, they just I truly, truly enjoy what we do. I just like yourself wish I could get more of the word out there to help so much more speed up the process. Uh, because there are a lot of people, a lot of young veterans coming back with that can feel very lost. Um, and this is a great way to fix a lot of things. Man, I've, I've seen a big change. Um, Matt, I can't thank you enough um, for coming in, everything you've done for our community, um, for me and my family, um, and, and also for your family. Um, I think what you do really does help a lot of people. Um, you're, you're saving lives. 
Thank you. Please keep it up. Uh, anybody struggling, if you're a veteran, please reach out to organizations uh, like the VA, like a dog trainer, even if it seems different. For a long time, I think we said that veterans deserve nothing, and now it's veterans deserve something. And um, let's try and have that thing that veterans deserve be quality and be something that can help. Again, Matt, thank you so much. That's really thank you for having me. That is going to be it for this presentation. Thank you.